It's an immense pleasure for me to welcome you all to this special colloquium inserted in the webinar series of the Graduate Program in Physics of the Federal University of Pará in Amazonia, Brazil. I ask everyone to kindly leave the microphone and camera turned off, except for the moment you're going to speak. Questions will be allowed in the end, unless otherwise, otherwise requested by the speaker. The questions can be asked using the chat, both in the Google Meet room and in YouTube. Today, we have the great honor to listen to Professor Michel Gustave Edouard Mayor, who was awarded with the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physics, together with Didier Patrick Kellaw and Philip James Edwin Peebles, for contributions to our understanding of the evolution of the universe and Earth's place in the cosmos. Professor Michel Mayor was born in Lausanne, Switzerland, obtained his master's in physics at Lausanne University in 1966, Certificat d'Astronomie et d'Astrophysique in 1968 and PhD in 1971, both at the University of Geneva. He became associate professor in 1984 and full professor in 1988, also at the University of Geneva, which he has been permanently linked ever since. Professor Mayor is member of the European Academy of Sciences, foreign associate of the French Academy of Sciences, honorary fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society in the UK, foreign member of the National Academy of Sciences of United States and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, is an honorary member of the American Astronomical Society and of the European Geosciences Union. Presently, our special guest is Professor Emeritus at the Université de Genève in Switzerland. Apart from the Nobel Prize in Physics, Professor Mayor Research has been honored with numerous Prizes and recognitions, including the Karl Schwarz Medal in 2010, Gold Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society, and the Tycho Brahe Prize awarded by the European Astronomical Society in 2015. The Jean-Dominique Cassini Medal awarded by the European Geosciences Union in 2016, and Officer of the French Order, Légion d'Honneur and Wolf Prize Physics, in 2017. Other worlds in the universe, the quest for Earth twins and maybe life, is what Professor Mayo will tell us about today. And I should not make you wait longer to listen to him. Professor Michel Mayo, thank you very much once again for having accepted our invitation. Okay. From this moment on, the thank audience you is very yours. Much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody in Brazil. For me, it's afternoon, but it's a pleasure to discuss a little bit what is going on in the field of Earth's twins and maybe the search for life in the universe. But before starting this lecture, I will just spend a couple of minutes for a few points of the history of, of that domain. Uh, still recently, in the first part of the, of the last century, people was discussing how many planetary systems we have in the Milky Way. You see this uh, just a picture of the central part of the, of the uh, Milky Way. And the question was how many planets we have and maybe how many habitable planets uh, exist. And uh, the system, uh, so the, the answer is not so evident because if you are looking in the literature and you are looking uh, the prediction, the estimated number of planetary systems uh, published by people as important as Gene, Shapley, Russell, and others, you see that uh, during the first part of the 20th century, the typical estimation was we do not have other planetary systems in the Milky Way, except maybe one or two or very small number. And it's only in the middle of the last century that suddenly the idea, the paradigm changed completely, jumping from with, with, by 1 billion or, or 10 billion and so on. And uh, you see that uh, the level up was expected to be something like maybe 100 billion or, or planet in the solar system. And it's very interesting to see 
how, what is the reason of this change? In fact, the, the reason of this change in a good direction was due to the very bad arguments. In fact, in, the, in 1943, uh, two teams of astronomers in the US uh, claimed the discovery of planet orbiting very close by M dwarfs. So people say, oh, if we have planet uh, among our closest neighbor, that we can estimate it, the number should be something like 10 billion or so on. And, and just after it was rejected, it was a fake detection, it was not real detection. But nevertheless, the direction was absolutely good. And the real good argument arrived in 1952 with a very small letter by Otto Struve. Uh, Otto Struve uh, did a very good comments he, he observes that the rotation of stars at the lowest part of the main seconds was very low. Very, uh, the GKM stars was uh, slowly rotating stars. And he said, this is, what is the reason of that? Because if you have the collapse of, for the formation of, of planet of stars, we always have an excess of angular momentum. And if the angular momentum is so small that we should have converted this angular momentum in the axial rotation of a disk. Uh, and this is the origin of the nebula to, to, to allow the formation of planet. Because this was the, the missing point in the, during the first part of the century, because we do not have good physical explanation for the formation of a nebula uh, for the formation of planet. This is really the first very good idea to, to explain that we should have a lot of planet in the, in the Milky Way. But you can notice this is only in the middle of the last century. It's very recent change of paradigm. Then after maybe some of you remember in the, in the 70s, uh, people have detected an excess of infrared radiation coming from young stars. And this was correctly attributed to a disk of dust uh, orbit, or, or hosted by the, uh, young, young stars. So this is the, first, the very first observational evidence of the existence of this disk of, of uh, matter. And then after you have a, a lot of work made in this direction. And you have, for example, uh, it's one paper among many others published by Beckwith and collaborators. And if you notice the last sentence of this paper devoted to the search of circumstellar disk around young stellar object, is, they said, our result demonstrate that disk more massive than the minimum mass of the protosolar system commonly accompany the birth of solar mass stars and suggests that planetary systems are common in the galaxy. So you see, the, the, the idea changed quite quickly between the middle of the century and the early 90s. And then after we arrive, I would say, with the modern technology uh, observation, and this is in 95, the direct observation of this protoplanetary disk. In the Orion Nebulae, you can see, uh, for example, young stars with few million years only, still surrounded by this disk of dust and gas. So this, at, at this time, uh, the things was evident that we should have almost every star with planet. And today, with the uh, arrival of the observation made with the uh, ALMA uh, instrument in, in Chile, you have a lot of observation devoted to the observation of young stars with the structure of all these nebulae surrounding very young stars. And this is very active domain because this is the place where we have the, the, the possibility to, for the formation of a new planetary system. In parallel to this uh, progress in the understanding of the possibility to have many planetary systems, 
in the same period, you have a lot of activities uh, devoted to the instrumentation, how to search for planet. Already in 1952, Otto Struve published a very small letter uh, mentioning that maybe we can search for exoplanet, exoplanet by looking at the change of the radial velocity of uh, stars, were evidently perturbed by the, the rotating planet. Uh, evidently, at the time, we do not have any instrumentation to, to, to fulfill such a idea. But you see, uh, from 1973 to, to the present time, you have a lot of team having tried to, to, to increase the precision of velocities following the idea of Struve. You have, for example, uh, the telluric lines by Griffin in 73, but the precision was not enough. And then after, you have several appro instrumental approach. I have uh, indicated in yellow on this uh, uh, image only the team having really worked to search for planet. Evidently, the most important one is Bruce Campbell and Gordon Walker, uh, already in '79, uh, using uh, hydrogen fluoride cell, an absorption cell, with a precision typically of 15 meters per second. And this was really the first, I would say, high precision instrumentation. And then after you have the arrival of the people from California, Marcy and Butler, and after we have what we have done with uh, in Europe with Baran and Kelo, and uh, gradually the precision increase. And uh, in 2000, we arrive at, at the level of about one meter per second. And uh, most recently, but a little bit later, evidently, uh, you have the arrival of Espresso Spectrometer, we'll discuss later this instrument. Uh, leaded by Francesco Pepe with a precision of something like 0.1 meter per second. Uh, just to appreciate the, the, this, this uh, competition to get to have a better precision is because the, the effect of, of Jupiter on the, on the velocity of the sun is a level of 11 or 12 meters per second. And uh, the Earth is only at the level of 0.08 meter per second. So evidently, if you have an instrument with a higher precision, you have the capability to explore the domain of uh, much smaller planets. And uh, we start uh, with a French colleague uh, to build a new instrument, uh, uh, a spectrograph uh, uh, to measure the precision, the velocity of stars, the change of the velocity of stars. And we start a, a relatively ambitious program with Didier Kelo in 1994. And we were uh, dreaming to find first bone bars because we don't have any anticipation of the, of the precision of this subject. And maybe much later to find a giant planet. And because uh, the paradigm at the time that the the, the shortest period we can dream to have for a Jupiter, a Jovian planet, was to have at least a period of 10 day, 10, no, 10 years, because you need to accumulate ice particles, and uh, ice particles cannot exist too close to the star, so you need to have uh, maybe a uh, semi-major axis of 10, 5 AU, so a, pre a period of, of, of 10 years. And this was quite in agreement with what we observe in the solar system. And suddenly, in the fall of 94, we discovered with Didier this very strange object with uh, about the mass of Jupiter, a little bit less, but with a period only of four days. And it looks very so crazy because it was a discrepancy by a factor of 1,000. It's not a small disagreement with the prediction of the theory. So it's the reason why we decided to postpone the, the announcement by still one, p one season to be sure that the stability of what we observed. And it's only in July 95 that we arrived at the, the phenomenon that was absolutely stable, amplitude, period, phase, everything was quite fine. And finally, we decided to, uh, to announce this object. And this is uh, uh, about a Jovian planet but hosted by a solar type star, a very normal solar type star. And this was the beginning of the story. 
and how we can, uh, I, I will be very quick on that, but uh, what is the reason of this huge discrepancy between uh, the prediction of the formation of Jovian planet by agglomeration of ice particles, so with a period larger than 10 years, in fact, uh, and we observe an object, similar type of object, but only at 0.05 astronomical unit. So uh, the, re the, the answer is the interaction be between the young planet and the disk. And this, is a, if, if you have the young planet, you can notice this on this image, uh, the mass of the young planet will induce some density wave in the disk of dust and, and gas. And at the resonance in the disk, you have some large excess of matter. And after you can calculate the reaction of this excess of matter to the orbit of the young planet, and you have to integrate on all the resonance. And the end, you have a shrinking and a migration of the star, of the planet in direction of the star. This is the, the reason why we can understand uh, the existence of so, so small uh, period. And what is very strange that, in fact, the answer was already existing before the discovery of 51 peg. You see already in 1980, so 15 years before, Goldreich and Tremaine developed quite extensively this, this theory. And after you have a lot of paper by Papaloid, Zulin, and so on, having in, uh, giving the same, the same uh, description of this phenomena. But apparently nobody believed in it. And if you are looking the literature, you can see that you have the founding paper by Goldreich and Tremaine in 1980, but you have in 1984, 86, 86, and so you have plenty of people with, with uh, explicit title uh, mentioning the role of the exchange of angular momentum and so on. So it's very strange. Nobody take into account this fact to, 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 for the strategy to, to search for planet. And it's only after the discovery of 51 peg and the explanation of the link to orbital migration by Lynn Bodenheimer Richardson in 1996 that we start really to understand the, the, the diversity of planetary system because we will see the, the reaction, uh, the, the consequence of this effect will be uh, a huge diversity of planetary system. So we start in Haute-Provence with a two, two meter telescope, uh, old telescope, but this was not the point. The point was a new spectrograph built with a colleague from Haute-Provence Observatory. But evidently, after, this was very big to develop the instrumentation. And in 2003, we have installed a new spectrograph on the 3.5 meter, 3.6 meter telescope at La Silla Observatory. It's called ARPS. And this instrument arrived immediately at about one meter per second. It's a vacuum spectrograph and so on. So it was certainly uh, much evolved instrumentation, much higher resolution, vacuum, and so on. Uh, and this is, uh, is still working at La Silla with almost the only instrument uh, for the full time of the 3.6 meter telescope. Okay, you see this with DJ in, in face of the two telescopes we are using, the 1.2 meter telescope, Euler telescope, and in the back, you have the 3.6 meter telescope. It's very Im impressive to see the progress made during the last 40 years in the field of the Doppler spectroscopy. You see the first cross-correlation spectrum. The cross-correlation is a technique to, to try to use the totality of the Doppler information in the, in the wide domain of wavelengths and by a uh, trick of cross-correlation to get only one data in the velocity. And you see a very first instrument, uh, Coravel on a one meter telescope uh, in 70 cent, we, we achieve something like 300 meters per second. It was not su sufficient for planet. And then after 15 years later, LOD uh, arrived already at 13 meters per second or two meter telescope. And this was the instrument having a load the discovery of 51 peg. But you see the most recent one in this list 
espresso, we'll see later, uh, achieve a precision of 0.1 meter per second. It's absolutely dramatic increase because uh, the size of the pixel is several thousand of meters per second. So you see, you see, we have something like better than 10 minus four of a pixel. So it's not so easy. So evidently the, the net result of this improvement of the, of the precision was the capability to increase the possibility to detect lower mass planet. You see that on, on, the, on the left side, you have the 51 pegs, the first red dot, dot in 95. And then after you have this huge increase of the discoveries of exoplanet made by quite a lot of different observatories. And the lower envelope, you see the Im huge improvement in the capability to detect lower mass planet. And already a few years ago, we achieved the possibility to detect uh, Earth-type planet by the Doppler wobble. Evidently, not at one year of period. At the time, it was on short period object. And most recently, you can see this uh, diagram where you see the mass versus the logarithm of the period, the orbital period, the code of uh, the colors reflect only the, the year of the discovery and it's only for Doppler spectroscopy. And you see that uh, uh, we start to achieve the domain of rocky planet. Uh, and we have one different uh, lower envelope line, uh, back lines, and you see one is uh, indicated as the limitation due to the stellar activity. And when we want to discover real Earth analogs, Earth twins, we are in the domain uh, where we do not have any detection up to now. Uh, one year and one Earth uh, mass planet is you completely still empty domain because you are really facing the difficulty of the stellar activity. I will discuss this point later. So with ARPS, we have been a low uh, we have been allocated a huge number of observing nights, uh, and we have decided to have some kind of ex comprehensive survey of the source on sky. And uh, the first surprise after a few years was to discover a huge population of super Earths. You see that we have discovered a huge, they are the most difficult object to detect, but between one and 10 times the mass of the Earth. But you see that we have discovered quite a lot of objects. And this kind of planets do not exist in the solar system. So this was the discovery of this, uh, what is called super Earth. And uh, evidently the, the mapping the, of this uh, domain of mass and period and other parameters can be if we control the, the detection limit of your technique, you can compare to the theory. And this is currently done with, with different teams, with the team of Tokyo or, Benz or Bern in Switzerland. You have some people working to understand the formation of planets. From, you see that w the domain of period and mass is completely distributed between, between uh, the domain of 10 years or something like this or more and to, to, to very, very short period. And we need to understand the physics of behind all this, uh, the formation of these very diverse parameters. And you can see here some uh, simulation made at the Bern University by Benz and collaborators. And you see the combination of agglomeration and migration and you populate the domain and you can rely this kind of object with the core composition, rocky and icy and so on. So we can, we, we can start the, to have the possibility to, to have a dialogue between theory of the formation of planetary system and the observations. And uh, as uh, we have this, this kind of very strange object with very short period, immediately we dream 
to have the possibility to to discover uh, eclipse or transiting planet. And uh, in ninety in ninety nine, uh, we have discovered an object with a period of three point five days, so a little bit closer than uh, fifty one peg, and. Uh, Immediately, we collaborate with some colleagues in US and, for example, with Tim, Tim Brown in Boulder with a very impressive telescope of only 10 centimeters in his garage. You see, just at the predicted time for the transit, in fact, uh, Tim was able to observe the transit with a, a contrast of about one person. And this was very important because was, this was really the proof that we are observing planets. We can derive the density, and we de we it's very easy, evidently. And the, the density is only 0.3 gram per cubic centimeter. So this is uh, typically the signature of a gas giant planet, because as you can compare, to, for example, to the mean density of Saturn, and Saturn is only 0.7 gram per cubic centimeter. So it was very important. And the, the next step uh, was uh, evidently our colleagues asked for time with the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is the same planet, but seen from the space below. The, the scale is not the same on the two diagram, but you see, look at the quality of the photometry you can have when you are in the space. And the Hubble Space Telescope was not designed for that. So this was immediately a string, strong, strong, stimulation to develop specific mission to search transiting planet. And you know, evidently, the huge success of the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, no, Kepler, Kepler mission, not Hubble, uh, because Kepler was a, an instrument of space uh, craft designed for specifically the photometry of planets uh, in a small field in the northern sky and after a few years you have here the plot of the discoveries made by this mission you have the radius on the order uh, on the on the left of the diagram and the period on an abscess and you see the huge number of detected planets it's a very small field with something like more than 100,000 stars and after a few years, you see the, all these transiting planets. And, and the code of colors indicates that for uh, many, many of these stars, you have several planets orbiting hosted by the same star. You see, for example, the red dots are coding uh, stars with six planets orbiting the same star. You see, planetary systems are really, really common. Okay, uh, it was very nice, but not for us because uh, the field of the of the Kepler field, the Kepler field was in the northern sky, and ours was in the southern sky. So we have been obliged to develop a new instrument to be implemented in La Palma, uh, Canary Island, and we have started to to measure and to follow uh, the object discovered by by Kepler. But you can see that if you compare the, the, the size detected by the Kepler mission on the upper diagram on the screen, you see that most, most of the transit detected by Kepler correspond to very small uh, planet with diameter between 1 and 1.4 in this diagram. And on the lower part, the lower diagram, you have the, the result of two different uh, surveys in radial velocities. So we are not sensitive to the, to the size, but to the mass. And you have the, the survey made at Palomar with, by Howard and the ARPS uh, survey. And you see we have exactly the same that most of the objects we are discovering have very low mass in this diagram between one and three, for example. So, it was very worthwhile to, to develop a new instrument. And we have built, developed a new instrument, a uh, copy of ARPS, uh, but implemented in the northern sky at La Palma Island on a telescope of 3.5 meter uh, size. 
and uh, we have decided to devote most of the Garotti time we had to explore the domain of very low mass planet. In the fact, no, to, to small radius detected by Kepler, and then after by Doppler spectroscopy to detect the mass. Because if you have the mass and the radius, you can start to, to do some physics on the composition of this object. And the, here you have this very famous diagram where a plot with the radius versus the mass. And you see that all the, the, the points, all the planets we have with uh, something mass less than five times the mass of the Earth correspond are with a chemical composition uh, corresponding to Earth-type planet, to rocky planet. And then after, when the mass, uh, the, the mass excess, this kind of things, and then you can have some a large envelope and, and, and evidently the size increased quite a lot. So a lot of things can be done on this demo and continue to be done on this effect. And for example, you have this uh, publication most recently made by Otegi and collaborators, also working on uh, mostly on ARPS data. And you see the, the same diagram with, but with a much strict uh, control of the object uh, with very small, uh, very good precision. And you see the, reci the, the radius versus the mass. You see that you have the rocky planet domain. And then after you have the domain of uh, with volatiles and so on. So this is uh, the beginning of the uh, huge domain of, to understand the, the bulk the bulk composition of of uh, planets. But the difficulty is the stars. It's, there are no more the instrument, but there are the stars. Here you have evidently a very known image of the sun uh, with all these activities, the convective cells. You have the, the the magnetic activity signature and so on. And in the small box on the upper right, you can see few small dots. And at the same scale of the sun and the blue one in the middle is the earth at the same scale. So let's imagine the, imp the, the effect of the small dots when crossing the disk of a planet, of the star, uh, it's not a perfect disk, you see, due to the magnetic activity. And also, evidently, the, the velocity wobble is also not so impressive. So this is really the difficulty, how we can detect real Earth twin. So to try to understand the jitter of solar type stars, uh, Dumusk and collaborators have implemented uh, a small telescope of 10 centimeter something uh, in La Palma Island to measure the global luminosity of the of the sun uh, and and the global and the velocity to to feed the spectrograph ARPS during the day with the light coming from a fiber of this small telescope. And so you can have, without any competition, because it's during the day, you have a huge, huge monitoring of the velocity of the sun. And you, have, you start to be facing a lot of problems. You see that you have the equivalent of the magnetic cycle with period of several years. And you are looking, you have the effect of spots uh, with the typical of the rotation period of the sun, something like 30 days. And then after you have the effect of on one day, you have some activity and granulation, the, the granulation. And you have the, the, the oscillation with a period of few day, few minutes, five minutes typically. So th this is the, the, the dust aspect of the measurement of precise velocities. And for example, here you have a long series of measurement of the sun, of the velocity of the sun, uh, made on, uh, you see here, it's only some one year, something like this. And you see the velocity have sometimes have changed by few meters per second. And we are dreaming to find uh, effects correspond to a tenth of a meter per second, 0.1 meter per second. 
So you have different approach made presently. Sometimes where you are trying to to have some un, uh, come on, Gaussian process to to eliminate the noise in this kind of things, and you see, for example, a colleague of Meron and other colleagues achieve the capability, the same measurement as before to diminish the noise to something like 0.5 meters per second. Okay, it's uh, still too much because for example, Venus will have an uh, amplitude, a semi-amplitude of 0.1 meters per second, but it's not too bad. If you have enough measurement, we are not too far to, to have the possibility to detect the wobble of the velocity of stars induced by Earth type, or Earth twin planets. So uh, in view of this uh, goal, eventually you need to have a very precise instrument and if possible, located, installed on a big telescope because eventually you need a lot, a lot of photons to achieve a measurement at the level of 0.1 meter per second. So uh, a few years ago, a new spectrograph, quite similar to ours, but with adapted to an eight meter telescope was implemented at La Silla Observatory, uh, on, but with the capability to collect the light of the four eight meter telescope. So typically you are underground, on the top of Parana, you have the a laboratory with a, with a spectrograph with the goal to achieve 10 centimeters per second and with the capability to select one eight meter telescope. But if the scientific goal is big enough to receive the light from the eight meter telescope, it's a very high resolution spectrograph. Evidently, this is a normal spectrograph, except of this very exceptional stability. Uh, in fact, you can, okay, so this is the main purpose to search for Earth-sized planet, but many other interesting points could be addressed. For example, you can dream to do it cosmology to, to, to test the stability of the constant, the fundamental constant of the physics uh, when you are measuring a very distant quasar in the universe, or you can evidently have extremely nice spectra in the local group of galaxies to see the anomalies of, of abundances and many other things. So just to have an idea, this is, you see, it's a huge spectrograph. You see the stabilization of the temperature, it's a level of one millikelvin. So it's a very high level spect stability. And this is a relatively old uh, test during the commissioning you see that it was a repetition of a lot of measurement. Uh, each one only a five minutes for eight, mit eight magnitude stars. And you see that the photon loss was 25 centimeter, but the dispersion was 28. So uh, we can see where they are not too, too far from the 10 centimeter of uh, dreamed to have. Just to have an idea of what is called the cross correlation. Here, it's only 10% of the domain covered by espresso. You see, you, if you, you have to consider a spectrum 10 times larger, and you see the huge amount of Doppler information installed in this kind of, of spectra. Thousands, thousands of lines. But remember that we need to measure at, at the, uh, a precision of something like 0.1 meter per second. So it's a, it's a better than uh, one billionth of the wavelengths. So it's a much smaller effect than the waves of one period. Evidently, we have several pixels. Just, I will just give one uh, recent uh, achievement of the, of the people using Espresso. Uh, these are the measurements made by this spectrograph on Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is not so bright star. Uh, and you see the measurement on the left, and you see the very complicated curve. Uh, and on the right, you have when you disentangle, uh, you can see that you have the two, two planets. One is uh, in the habitable zone of this object, 
uh, and in another one discovered in this paper. You see that and the noise is it's a, it's a much smaller fraction of a meter per second, evidently. Another interesting simulation, it's not a, an observation. Uh, some people um, have uh, chosen a set of, of measurements made on a star with ARPS, and they have superimposed a supposed set of measurement on a planet with something like a period of 340, uh, 40, no, 400 days and uh, a period or uh, a mass of something like three times the mass of the Earth. And you see that, in fact, with in the, independently of the jitter, you can see the jitter at the level of one meters per second. In fact, the simulation show it is possible to detect a, a little bit more massive planet than the Earth. It corresponds to a, a mass of 2.7 uh, times. N. So, OK, it's difficult, but it's not completely desperate. I mentioned before the fact that uh, we have a lot of uh, transiting planet. And recently, this is a very huge domain for the future, is the capability to compare the spectra of transiting, uh, of stars hosted by transiting planet when you have the, the spectrum in front or behind the star, when you compare the size of the, the two spectra, in fact, you have access to the opacity of the, the atmosphere, the planetary atmosphere, when the planet is in front and then after when it's behind. So we can do some spectroscopy just comparing the transiting spectra and uh, the, the star without transiting planet. And you see already today, a lot of chemical components, uh, mole molecules and so on, have been detected. I'm absolutely sure this will be the, the huge domain for the future with the arrival of the large telescope, like we will discuss later. Why people are so interested in this kind of things is evidently the problem of life. First, do we have some evidence of life on other rocky planet, and maybe is it possible to 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 come a check or to to understand this statement made by Christian de Duves that to see life as a cosmic imperative. So, what is the meaning of this thing? It's when you have all the good conditions for the life development, the chemistry of life. In fact, life will appear spontaneously. So this can. Uh, theoretically, in the, or in the lab, we cannot answer to this point, but we can observe stars, and this is uh, the role of ast astronomer, astrophysicist. So, at the present time, you have a huge kind of set of possibilities. First, you have the mission to search transiting planets orbiting bright stars, because you need, as possible, to have uh, bright stars. You have TESS, KEOPS, Plateau in few years, James Webb. In the domain of spectroscopy, you have uh, Espresso, but I know that other big instruments are in course of development. And after, you have the possibility to have space and ground-based spectrograph to try to, to search the, the anomaly in the, in the spectra due to biomarkers on, on other companies. So this is typically a domain with a huge possibility on the, for the coming years. And I will not describe uh, in detail uh, exactly what we are dreaming for. But for example, you see this very famous diagram already made uh, already something like 30 years ago that uh, with, uh, and thanks to the space mission in the solar system, uh, people have noticed this huge a signature at 9.7 micron in the spectra of the Earth due to the ozone molecules. And evidently, this molecule is not observed in Venus and in Mars atmosphere. So this is the signature of a, an atmosphere with a very large fraction of oxygen. And uh, this is considered to be very 
uh, strong evidence of the of bio evolution biochemistry in this atmosphere and uh, this, so this will be to we would like to try to to find something similar in exoplanet but it's, it is and you have as as a good yeah, possibility to detect other compound uh, chemical compound uh, elements uh, maybe not so big as the uh, oxy ozone uh, signature for example we can dream to see the what is called the atmospheric seasonal seasonability of an exoplanet you see this is a measurement made of the, the earth you see that the the upper curves show the very well known carbon dioxide curve in the earth from 2000 to 2014 so we have a slope because this is the, the evolution of the of the climate chain of it's a the increase of the carbon dioxide uh, uh, part in the atmosphere. But what is more significant in this domain is this modulation with one year. This is due because the, the biomass on the Earth is not symmetric. So if we can detect such something similar to an, another planet, rocky planet, in fact, we have a strong suspicion that we have a something equivalent changing the carbon dioxide or the methane composition so this is very in the indirect detection of a biosignature but you can dream also to see the effect of the reflectance and polarization of biopigment for example the chlorophyll the carotenoid and so on have some drastic uh, discontinuity in the spectra so maybe this it's not easy but it's just to explain that the detection of life in the universe is not an easy thing a, a lot of efforts are made for that but we are not in the domain of star star games or things like that well. but eventually we will have much much more powerful instrument because as said, we need a lot, a lot of photons to have the capability to see this very small effect. And if, for example, here, the ELT with a diameter of 39 meter, part, it's absolutely incredible. And uh, due to have the first light in 2025, you can notice the size of a van close to the, to, to, to the ground of the, on the on the right of this dome so it's uh, absolutely huge and this was uh, the the level of this instrument or already two years ago the basement was already made so uh, just to compare here you have the uh, comparison of the different instrument presently in the development you have for example the or, or existing you have, for example, the two Keck telescope on the upper right. And just for comparison, you have the ELT with this 39 meter telescope uh, below. And you have a other mission, for example, you have 30 meter, meter telescope, dream to be at Mauna Kea, but probably will be appear in another place. And you have the, the Magellanic Cloud uh, telescope, and you have the VLT for all these things. But you see, we enter in this epoch of huge, huge telescope. Evidently, we have not to forget the James Webb with the 6.5 meter telescope, but in the space. And um, absolutely, at least in the chemistry of transiting planet, it can bring a lot of things and also images. So, thank you very much. Okay, Professor Michel Mayor, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. I'd like at this moment to ask everybody to turn on their microphones for a huge round of applause in retribution for this excellent seminar. Okay, so now let's yes, wait for uh, 
for the people to turn off their microphones uh, for us uh, uh, to continue. So uh, we have already some questions uh, in the audience, uh, but while people get encouraged to make other questions, let me give you an overview of the audience of around 100 people that you have had uh, during your uh, lecture. So uh, let me tell you to start that we have had uh, people attending you from almost all around Brazil, from north to south, the states of Amapá, Pará, Pernambuco, Paraíba, Rio Grande do Norte, Minas Gerais, Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, Rio Grande do Sul e Santa Catarina, down there in Brazil, around 3,000 kilometers from where, where we are now. Obviously, uh, we, had, we have had the participation of our uh, uh, undergrad and graduate students, postdocs, teachers, and professors of our graduate program, like Angela Cautal, Jorge Castineiras, people from the countryside of the Pará State, like, for instance, Ab Abaitetuba. We have had the participation of, pe of people of other areas, like Cicero Regis from Geophysics. We have had also the participation of teachers of the, uh, of the high school, uh, but with uh, uh, education in this, uh, 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 in the area, like Lisangela Almeida. Uh, and we have had uh, undergraduate and graduate students, teachers, postdocs, professors from many universities, institutes, and observatories around Brazil, just to mention some of them, Argemiro Midones, uh, Edson Moreira, Flávio D'Amico, uh, Gustavo Lanfranchi, Helena Petrilli, Elia Shapiro, José Vera, Kepler Oliveira, Luan Guese, uh, Marcelo Chiaparini, uh, Marcelo Siqueira, Natalia Moller, Odílio Aguiar, Paulo Silva, Rodrigo Sobreiro. So from universities from the north, from, from Amazonia, from the northeast, from the southeast, and from the south of Brazil. And not only that, we have had participants from different places around the world. I can mention, for instance, Alexander uh, Kamanchik uh, and Stefano Liberati that are attending, I believe, from Italy, Aloki Kuma from India, and Olivier Sarbak from Mexico. <laughs> So it's, it's it quite a representative audience. <laughs> thank okay. you. Okay, we thank you, Professor. So uh, we have, uh, uh, well, the first registered uh, question that I have here comes from uh, Lavik Tavares de Oliveira. Uh, he is, as far as I understood, a graduate student from Cajazeiras uh, in the countryside of the state of Paraíba in the northeast. Lavik, do you want to make the question yourself or do you want me to read it? You can read it. Okay. So, uh, as I said, Lavik is a, a graduate student and he's asking, do you think that it's possible to find a better way to search for exoplanets, for instance, with James Webb? Uh, can we expect a big revolution in, in this area uh, with uh, future searches? Uh, okay, the, the the capability in terms of images of the web, of the James Webb will be beautiful. It's evident, and also the capability in the high resolution spectroscopy in the infrared. So, uh, as far as I know, they will not have the capability to detect a biomarker in rocky planet because you have. You compare the spectrum of the of the star when the planet is just in front or behind. So for a rocky planet, the atmosphere is very very thin. It's very small compared to the size of the of the star. So, but I'm sure that they will have the possibility to do this for super Earth, few times the mass of the Earth. Uh, I, I don't see any competition between both instrumentation because on the ground you have the, the huge size of the telescope. So you and and recently people have shown that the superb results in spectroscopy have been achieved from the ground. Uh, so because the resolution is very high and the size of the telescope is very big, 
So it will be very interesting. I, I cannot promise anything what will be the most important uh, results. You see, recently, uh, Kepler give beautiful things. Spitzer telescope give beautiful access to absolutely fantastic results, but the, si the, the ground also. So let's say a wait. Okay, okay. So uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Lavik, for your question. Thank you, Professor Michel Mayor, for your answer. Uh, now uh, we have a question from uh, Satish Kuma, uh, VH from uh, UniRio in Rio de Janeiro. Satish, do you want to make a question yourself? Yes. Thank you, Luis. Uh, thank you, Professor Mayor, for the talk. Um, That's it. Did you say? Someone was able to find the transit of a planet using 10 centimeter telescope. Yes, when yes, yes, when we we measured the uh, the planet in '99, uh, it was a, a bright star. It was a seventh magnitude star, and in we gave this uh, ephemeride to a colleague in Boulder uh, for different reason. We uh, collaborate with them with David Charbonneau and Tim Brown. And it's so bright stars. If you have a CC, you, you, it's, a, it's, it's better to have a small telescope and not a too big one, because if not, you will have too many photons on the CCD. So it's the reason why. <coughs> but it, it, the, the critical question is to have the capability to, be, to do very precise photometry on the CCD. It's not so easy. To, to, to achieve a one, one uh, percent of photometry. Uh, but recent, uh, more recently, you have some people having developed some instrument uh, in different places where they, they can achieve from the ground a precision of one milli magnitude. So you see already from the ground, people are doing quite a lot of progress on the photometry. But, uh, and you, I, I have some, uh, knowledge that uh, some uh, schools uh, in, in in England have made some discovery of exoplanet or at least transit of exoplanet uh, from the roof of the school. So, but uh, you see the competition is difficult because most of them are too far for this. Yes, th that's the reason I asked because undergraduate students can do this kind of rediscovery using their small telescope as undergraduate projects, but you say it's difficult. Yes, yes, but it's possible. I, I, okay. If you have uh, a CCD, a small telescope, and you have to take care of the software because you, you have to, to you, can, you, you should avoid to have the star only on one pixel. Because if you have a small change of the, 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 the sensitivity of the pixel and you have small jitter of the star on the pixel, okay, you start to lose the precision. So, but if you distribute the, the size of the star on many pixels and you have the good software, in fact, it's possible to do it. And, and I'm sure that is, you, you have plenty of people able to do this. But it's quite different if we want to discover new object. We, if you do not know in advance where, what star to look, what time is a good timing for the, for the transit, it's a complete different story. But if you know in advance and you want just only to, to, to check and to do some experiment for students, it's possible. Wonderful. Happy to know that. Um, now, have any biomarkers been discovered for 51 PEG? Thank you. No, 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 no. 51 PEG is the temperature in the atmosphere of, uh, of 51 PEG is more than 1000 Kelvin. So it's certainly not a good place for chemistry. And if you want to spend some <laughs> holidays, you have to choose another star. <laughs> <laughs> Go elsewhere. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Satish, for your questions. Thank you, Professor Mayor, for your answers. Now uh, we have registered for for a question. Lucas Montenegro, who is an undergraduate student at uh, Paraíba, in, also in the northeast. 
Lucas, do you want to make the question yourself? Yeah, I can make it. Right. Um, so, Professor, first of all, thank you for the lecture. It was amazing. And my question would be, um, you talked about the migration of exoplanets, and I'd like to know if this migration is possible uh, not only when the star is very young, but also for other periods of the star evolution, like for a star like the Sun, which is already stable, could we observe something like the migration of planets, like the, the change in the angular momentum? Yes, you could. It, it's, it's evident that the most important migration exists at the time when you have the disks of dust and, and so. But then after you have several planets and you have some inter gravitational interaction between the different planets. So, uh, and then if you still have a lot of uh, asteroids and so on, you have some global change of the orbits and you have some, uh, some work made by different people on the, on the change of the orbital parameters. And the problem of the stability of planetary system is a very difficult one. It's a very classical, a big problem addressed by people having developed this uh, very clever uh, software to, to have the precision to be able to integrate on some billion of stars, 10 planets, or something like this. And uh, it's evident that sometimes you have some kick out of some planet out of some planetary system. And we, we can dream or we can do some fictions on some free floating planets because they have been ejected for a planet. But, but at the present time, we be, be safe. The, the, the evolution of orbital parameters in the solar system is, is, is very stable. We don't have orbital migration today. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Lucas, for your question. Thank you, Professor Moreau, for your answer. So, uh, Lavik has another question. He is asking uh, if you could, uh, so, uh, uh, are there uh, searches with, uh, on chemical basis, uh, if you could speak a little more about that? Uh, I'm not sure, I will try to add. Uh, already just after the very few first discoveries of exoplanet. Uh, one U.S. colleague did the remark Then all, I believe the, it was during only four planet, Jovian planet, was all with excess of uh, chemical abundance, so metal abundance. So 51 peg is something, I don't remember, 0.3 or something like this, uh, Fa over H. So it seems that uh, Javian planets like to be associated with stars with uh, uh, excess of metals, of, of metals in terms of astronomy, so it's uh, heavy elements. And then after uh, this was completely uh, confirmed by different people, and right now uh, the occurrence of giant planet is much larger if the star is metal rich. For example, if you have a, a, a solar type star with a, a chemi, a F over H of, of 0.3, it's a factor two in excess of the sun. In fact, you have something like 25% of chance to have a Jovian planet. But if it's minus 0.3, so it's a factor two less than the sun, it's dropped to 3% or something like this. So you have a strong link between the chemical composition and, and, uh, and the presence of the frequency of a giant planet. And this was at the root of different program where people try to increase their chance to detect planet to select only metal rich stars. So it was a good idea, but not for people having trying to do statistics. But because after you are losing this information, you have a bias due to this selection example. But okay, it's life. Okay, 
So uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Lavik, for your second question. Thank you, uh, Professor Michel Maior, for your answer. So the next question comes from uh, Rafael Martinez. Rafael, do you want uh, to make the question yourself? Otherwise, I can read it. So, uh, so uh, he has written, rocky exoplanets are expected to have the same composition as in our solar system. Could that influence uh, their exospheres too? Uh, I missed uh, part of the, the connection was not so good. Please, can you repeat? Yes, I'll do that. Uh, also, uh, Rafael wrote that his connection is not so good. So, uh, if <laughs> rocky exoplanets are expected to have the same composition as the rocky planets uh, of our solar systems, uh, and if that could influence uh, their exospheres too. Oh, uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not ex ex expert at all in the geophysics or, or exo exo geophysics uh, no I, I i don't know I, I know that you have a lot of people working now on the interaction between the internal part of the planet and the atmosphere uh, i don't know it's it's a very complicated story for example you see one of the critical point for the stability of the life on the Earth was the fact that you have to maintain the temperature on billion years. And this is not so easy because the, the, you have a huge set of changes. For example, the original composition of the atmosphere was something like 96% of carbon dioxide. So with this huge amount of carbon dioxide, you have a huge uh, a, uh, what is the name? Uh, effect to increase the temperature. Then after, you have a chemical reaction where you have a reaction of the carbon dioxide with the rock, and you have a drop of the of the abundances of COT, carbon dioxide. And so, but the sun at the time at the beginning was forty percent less em e effective at today. So you, you have this competition between the decrease of the carbon dioxide and the increase of the luminosity of the sun, and so on. So you see, and then after, you have to re-inject re some carbon dioxide with a volcanism. And this is only possible if you have uh, plate tectonics. But what is the plate tectonics when the mass is three times the mass of the Earth? You see, People claim, uh, okay, they discover Earth, uh, an exoplanet with three times the mass of the Earth. So, oh, this is the best target for life development. But what is the plate tectonic when we have three times the mass of the Earth? If, if it is too efficient, the continents, if they exist, will be refreshed much too quickly to have something interesting appearing on the top. So you see, the geophysics of all this story is very, very complicated. And I'm certainly not an expert of this. Okay, so uh, thank you, Rafael, uh, for, your, for your question. Thank you, Professor Mayor, for your answer. Uh, well, uh, could you please uh, uh, tell us, uh, is, for instance, in gravitational wave search, we have this long-term projects like the LISA or something, I mean, that, that are planned for, like, say, 10, 15 years from now, something for the future. Uh, in the case of the exoplanet search, uh, is there a long-term major project going on, Professor? The last 20 years was really... Uh a very productive period to explore the domain of diversity, mass, and so on, a multiplanetary system. For some people, it's a, it's a beautiful play of dynamics of multiplanetary system, you know, multi, multi complex dynamics, and so on. 
But I am absolutely convinced the next 10 years will be the most promising uh, domain will be what I quickly describe in this one is the uh, exploration of the chemistry of the atmosphere of exoplanet. And this will be done with big telescope comparing the spectra of planet in face and behind. This is absolutely, because today people have made already a lot of progress, but they have been limited by the number of photons. So they have been able to detect uh, the most important uh, chemical elements, big molecules and so on. But I'm absolutely sure th this will be the, the, the highest productive domain on the next 10 years. It's the chemistry of atmosphere of planets. Observation and the theory, evidently. Thank you. And, and in this context, uh, uh, which would think you think will be the most promising uh, uh, techniques uh, uh, for the for the next, let's say, decade? Spectroscopy, spectroscopy of uh, transiting planet. And you right. see, you have also very fascinating uh, development. The name of the instrument was Ristretto. You see that uh, you have espresso, but now you have rest Ristretto. <laughs> it's uh, it's a uh, it's a new instrument where you try to combine high resolution uh, uh, imagery with a high level of adaptive optic and high resolution spectroscopy. Because when you have the planet relatively, no, not relatively, dramatically fine, close to the star, you have to compete with the diffraction of the, so you have first to limit the seeing effect, the diffraction, and then after to use the high resolution spectroscopy to try to do the spectroscopy of planet extremely close to, to the star. And this, I believe this is very fascinating because, uh, but you need the, the problem that the, in the infrared, in, it should be 10 to the six, 10 to the seven, the ratio between the luminosity of the star and the planet. But I believe the Tristretto instrument, it, it, it will be installed in a couple of months at La Silla. Uh, this is very, very, very promising. And this can be seen as a precursor for the instrumentation of the ELT. Evidently, the, the diffraction limit of the ELT is much better than uh, on a three meter telescope is 10 times smaller uh, the size. So, okay, it's a bit evident gain. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, so, uh, Lavik uh, wants to make a question himself. He wants to have the pleasure of talking to you. So, Lavik, uh, please turn on your microphone and make your question. Thank you, Michael, for your lectures. It's a good pleasure to have you here. And my question is about Merci. how the lunar telescope can have more advantages that offset the high cost. Because you and me knows there is a, a high cost to make this type of telescope. And it's not a government who have the who have the pleasure for make this telescope. And you and me have to say because a lunar telescope have more or no had not have advantages to make a lunar telescope and could make uh, advantage that offset the high cost. Okay, uh, it, it's different to answer because uh, on the ground on the Earth. No, we have the technical capability to build a telescope of 39 meter telescope size. And uh, if you have adaptive optics with laser to measure the defect of the, of the, uh, of the atmosphere, uh, so you can have a relatively nice uh, imagery of, of, of stars. And I believe we are far, far to have the capability to implement a, a so big telescope as the moon. And uh, 
uh, I don't see evident advantage to go on the moon. In the radio domain, it's a different domain, it's a different story. But in the optics, infrared, I don't see the reason to do it. But maybe I'm limited in my vision. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Lavik, for your question. Thank you, Professor Mayor, for your answer. So, uh, in terms of, of, of systems with several planets, like our solar system, so uh, could you say something about that? I mean, uh, exo uh, planetary uh, uh, systems. Mm -hmm. uh, I, sorry, I was obliged to put the battery <laughs> to put some connection. What, what is the question, please? So, yes. Uh, so, uh, so our, our solar system has several planets, right? Many planets uh, 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 around the sun. So, uh, uh, could you say something about the abundance of this kind of, of, of systems, uh, uh, exoplanetary systems of, uh, of that kind? Uh, it, it's a very good question because as a few years ago, 10, 15 years ago, people was always claiming that, okay, the solar, in the context of life, that our solar system is very unique because we have uh, all the rocky planet inside and so on. But uh, I believe we have, ex we have to be extremely careful on this kind of statement because, uh, Jupiter, let's imagine we are looking at the solar system with the same instrumentation we have today. Okay, Jupiter with his 11 days of period and uh, a, a wobble of the velocity of about uh, 11 meters per second will be detected. Will be. Saturn is not so evident because with 30, day, uh, 30 years of period, we, we will have only maybe a small, long period drift of the mean velocity. So not so evident to detect, uh, and it's only two, 2.8 meter per second. So, okay, we, we would have the possibility to detect Jupiter, that's all. All the rocky planets in the solar system, uh, then, let's say for the more massive one, mass, uh, Venus and the Earth will not be detected. So any claim to the, oh, we are very special, is not true. Because, and at the present time, we have a huge amount of multiplanetary system, but they are, okay, I don't have the, the, the image here, but most of them are very, very different of the, of the solar system. Because you see, the dynamics, the formation mechanism of planetary system is so complicated. You have first the problem, as claimed before, of the orbital migration, but you have some more complicated effect. For example, you have uh, we have the possibility to measure the inclination of the orbit of transiting planet compared to the spin of the star, because when the planet go in front of the star you have a small anomaly of the radial velocity curve and you can detect the, the change or the, the angle of the orbit. It's a, it called the uh, Rositer-McLaughlin Rosit effect. Okay, but what is very strange is that we have discovered a planet with a uh, retrograde orbit. And uh, so we have some, some orbits completely parallel or to, to the to the axis of rotation of the star. And this is the planet is formed in the disk, and this is the only physical process. You can not explain this kind of effect. So it's uh, the, the dynamical effect to be involved is called the cosine effect, that if you have a, a more massive object at some distance, maybe a double star, you have some interaction and you have the possibility to, to, to incline, to, so you see, you have so many uh, dynamical effects, evidently resonance, interaction. For example, recently, last week, I believe, or two weeks ago, people have uh, announced the discovery of a system with six planets, all in resonance. Two, four, eight, and so on. So, so it's very, okay, dynamics, 
classical Newton and dynamics is a new domain because you have so many interesting effects happening in right now. No, multiplanetary systems are extremely common. Yeah, I believe you have to, to remember the very basic things. Physics act everywhere in the same way. So if you have, we have observed disk of dust and gas in the Orion Nebula, the young stars. If you form planet, maybe the detail is different, the distribution of mass and so on. But you have multiplanetary system should exist everywhere. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Mayor. So maybe one last question from Professor Kepler Oliveira uh, of Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. So uh, Kepler, please go ahead. Professor Michel, it's been an absolute pleasure to listen to your talk. And I would like first to comment on the white dwarfs. There has been uh, meteors and there has been possible to measure the composition and they are similar to the composition of the Earth's meteors. So there's around the meteors falling on the white dwarfs. We can measure the composition. And because the, the sedimentation on the white dwarf is so fast, we can measure the composition of the material being accreted. And they have, it is solar composition uh, meteors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a, a different way to measure the composition of the material around stars, and at least the white dwarfs, they are near to the sun because they are too faint, so they are uh, solar composition, the, the stars probably the initial composition. Mm -hmm. so that's the reason the meteors are also solar composition. But uh, My question to you is on the ELT what would be the limit on the velocity for the planned instruments, for the first flight instruments, the, the precision on velocity measurements? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I don't know exactly because uh, we do not have the best of the precision immediately because today you see the real difficulty is no more the instrument. It's it when you have the, uh, the control of the spectrograph uh, stability by uh, atomic clock, laser comb, and so on. You, you have a, a huge stability at the level of the centimeter per second. But the real difficulty is the stars. And we have to, to, to do <laughs> around. And, uh, but you have a lot of people working with, how uh, uh, very clever kind of new algorithm uh, to to try to to extract the real wobble of low mass stars, a low, yes, low mass planet, uh, mm. uh, and uh, I, I believe I dream that we will achieve really ten centimeters per second, two point one meter. So, but this will be really difficult. But uh, uh, I'm also, because evidently I cannot speak about any too old the domain, but you need Kepler failed up, uh, after three years or something like this. I remember that. Yeah. So if you want to, f to detect transiting planet with one year of period, it's a very small deep. And after you have variability of the star, and you have a second small deep one year after, it, it's very difficult to, with the Kepler uh, records, to really detect the equivalent of Earth. But I, I know very well that the China's people are pre preparing a space mission to remeasure the Kepler star, the, the stars measured by Kepler, but to repeat, to have a second epoch, in fact, not one epoch, but several years after, to try to find this long-term Earth-type planet. So evidently, they will have the, the detection and the mass, but it's a huge advantage. If you, if you have some noise, but you know what is the period of the real signal interesting. 
it's much better than if you have no idea of the period of the planet. So I believe the combination between astrometry coming from uh, this China's mission and new spectrograph maybe will be able to 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 re to reveal the existence of real real Earth twin. Okay. For for okay. the okay. sorry for the for the problem of the for the bone dwarfs. Uh, I, okay, I'm not at all expert in this domain, but I remember many years ago that people was dreaming to find planet transiting in front of, of or, or at least to where you have the spectra of the planet with almost the same luminosity of the star of the brown bar. So, but will be much more much redder. So you will have the, the blue spectrum of the star. And the red spectrum of the pla of the of the planet, so uh, but I, I don't know if they succeed to find some object. Thank you so much, Professor. Merci. Okay. Kepler, okay. you, are, you have a pretty, <laughs> a very <Somewhat>. special <laughs> name. <laughs> thank sure. Okay. Thank you, Kepler, for your question. Thank you, Professor. Michel Mayor, not only for your answer, but for all your answers and for the wonderful uh, time we have spent uh, listen, in listening and learning with you. And uh, well, so before we finish, I'd like everybody to, I would like to ask everybody to turn on their microphones uh, a final time just for uh, a closed uh, round of applause in retribution for what we had today.